Hey everybody, uh, we're about to get started, but before we do, uh, I want to shoot a quick thank you out to all the sustainability champions who have signed our pledge. Uh, you can find it at tinyurl.com slash sustainablist and ask me if you can't sign this. Uh, spell it. Uh, so uh, this week I would uh, like to thank Therese Peffer, uh, Omid Kantiab, and Charlotte Rice for signing the sustainability pledge here in Satarjadai Hall. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm uh, delighted to introduce our speaker for today, and I'd like to uh, extend a welcome too for those that are watching this on the other campuses. Dr. Igor Mezic is a pr professor and director of the Center for Energy Efficient Design in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and the head of Buildings and Design Solutions Group at the Institute for Energy Efficiency at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he's been since 1995 except for a brief uh, stint in Harvard for a year and a half. Professor Mizich works in the field of dynamical systems and control theory. He and his students develop methods to analyze and control nonlinear dynamical systems and apply these methods to understand issues of theoretical and practical relevance in energy deficient design and operations. He earned his Diploma of Engineering in Mechanical Engineering at the University of uh, Rijeka in Croatia and his PhD in Applied Mechanics at the uh, California Institute of Technology. He has won the Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, NSF Career Award from NSF, and the George S. Axelby Outstanding Paper Award on the Control of Mixing from IEEE. He is an editor of Physica D, Nonlinear Phenomena, and an associate editor of the Journal of Applied Mechanics and SIAM Journal on Control and Optimization. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Igor. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, a little bit humbling to speak at the seat of most progressive ideas in energy efficiency in the world in the last 30 years, but I'm going to attempt to tell you something new um, uh, about some work that we have done at, down at UC Santa Barbara, uh, which is, uh, if you didn't know, your sister campus. Just kidding. Um, I'm going to talk about integrated technologies in building energy efficiency. Uh, the novelty here should be something that's uh, recognized and pursued on this campus quite well as well, and that is that sensing of data in buildings is becoming ubiquitous. So we are getting more and more data that are helping us to understand what buildings, what kind of conditions buildings operate under and what kind of uh, energy efficiency we get out of the buildings that, that are being built. Um, buildings tend to be very dynamic in nature, but when we design them and when we operate them, we usually don't um, utilize that particular perspective, except if you are an operator in the building who gets a call, somebody says it's very, very cold, and you change the setting on the thermostat so that that person is not cold anymore. That's dynamic, that's quick, but it's not necessarily an optimal way of operating. However, that's how most buildings in pretty much the whole world are operated at this point in time, if even like that. I mean, there might be a situation where nobody's there, so uh, it will be hot and cold and, and nothing's going to happen. Um, so I'd like to present a perspective that utilizes the data collection in the buildings and provide some algorithms to tell you what kind of parameter changes could be used in order to make the operation more efficient. So to two types of things. One is um, data gathering and organization of the information, so analytics. And the other part is what are the inputs and what are the outputs and which kinds of inputs affect which kinds of outputs and at, at which level. And in the meantime, I'll tell you why that's a complicated problem. I'll rush through this very, very quickly. Um, most of the people in the first and second row have seen this particular slide three million times. But uh, of course, 60% of all the energy that we produce on the left is wasted, according to the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, there might be people from LBNL here, so sorry, I produced this slide, it wasn't you. <laughs> and 40% uh, of that is used in buildings. Uh, you've seen this one too. 27% um, of all the all building energy is used in lighting, typically in commercial context, and then about 30% for space heating and space cooling. 
a lot of the work that we do relates to space heating and space cooling, as you're going to see. Very, very little of what I'm going to say pertains to lighting. Um, this is an LBNL slide, and uh, this is supposed to be a modern building, although the architecture here looks 60s or something like that. Uh, on the other hand, it has all kinds of beautiful engineering uh, devices uh, on it that have been devised to provide energy efficiency, automated blinds, uh, PV panels on the top, of course, the weather station so that we can actually take the data from the outside and, and pipe it down to this little corner over here that has integrated controls that's supposed to be the brain of the whole, of the whole operation. And uh, hopefully that computer here is going to provide <coughs> the instructions to this equipment so that the whole building can operate more efficiently. That's, that's the vision. Um, just by looking at the sort of spatial complexity of the arrangement in a building, um, one might conclude that this is not such an easy task. Uh, the other part of the equation that makes it not such an easy, so first of all, I have thousands of different things that I can possibly change if I'm allowed to have an infinite budget and change the energy efficiency in this building. So certainly from an engineering perspective, I don't want that. I neither want 1,000 different parameters, nor do I want, nor do I have an infinite budget, the B word. We have zero right now, as far as I can tell. So um, if you are to change something in the building, then the, the most effective thing that we can do today, given our own UC situation, is to provide changes that somebody can do by going to that corner and changing a couple of set points or schedules. Uh, fortunately, it turns out that set points and schedules are some of the most important things that you can do to changing, uh, well, your air conditioning systems shouldn't be operating 24 hours a day. Uh, but on the other hand, if you want to say, how exactly should it be operating? And which time should I turn it on if the next day is hot? Is it going to be six o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning? That becomes actually a pretty complicated scientific question. An algorithm that will determine an optimal operation for the whole building of this size is not such an easy thing. And that's where the intellectual core of the endeavor kind of sits. So operations are about dynamics of the building, including its occupants that provide a lot of uncertainty, as I'm going to qualify in, in the next slide. So you have dynamics that is complicated on its own right. It's forced by external elements, by weather. It's, it's also forced by the, the, the energy prices and things like that. And then you have occupants that are actually making the whole equation even more complicated. So. Um, I know most of you know this, but it, it truly is an interesting scientific question, how to do this for this, for this kind of a system. It, 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 at some level, it's much more interesting than, than um, operating a car. You know, a, a car, an object that we know for, or designing a car, an object that we know for, for 100 years, you have pretty well-defined components. There is not much heterogeneity as to exactly how things operate. And it's still an incredible engineering challenge to do 35, 40, 50 miles per gallon on the standard internal combustion engine. This should strike you as much more complicated because you have all kinds of heterogeneous systems in there. So where are the problems or what is the current practice and needs? And probably in the back of the room you cannot see some of this, but the, the top stage, this is lessons learned from case studies of six high performance buildings. And I want to mention every national lab in the in the, in the procession, so this is the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab. Lessons learned from case studies of six high performance buildings for Cellini and, and, and company. Um, it's a very, very interesting study and it's on what I would call unique buildings, the Zion National Park and, and places like that. They say properly applied off the shelf or state of the art, state of the shelf technologies are available to achieve low energy buildings. However, these strategies must be applied together and properly integrated in design, installation, operation to realize energy savings, and then they qualify. So they basically say, this is my wording in bold, they basically say there is a need for integration of best-in-class components. And then they say, here are the problems. There was often a lack of control software or appropriate control logic. Design teams were too optimistic about the behavior of the occupants, uncertainty. 
Energy savings from daylighting were substantial, but generally less than expected. Plug loads greater than design predictions. The effective insulation values are all often inflated when comparing the, the actual building to as design building and so on and so forth. Uh, the crux of the matter here is there is uncertainty, 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 and all goes in one direction, making your building worse. Why is that so? I don't know, but that's, that's what they concluded. Every, pretty much everything that, that they looked at was worse than as predicted or as designed. And maybe it's in human nature to be optimistic, so we are kind of optimistic about the things that we put in. But that's the state of affairs. So I'd argue that you need uncertainty analysis and integrated control software. What kind of control software are you going to put in there? Well, the control software cannot deal with the minute changes in the air temperature in this room. As I'm waving my hand, there is certainly some changes in the airflow that is going to contribute to some minute change in the temperature. That doesn't matter. What matters is the collective dynamics. And if I can handle, if I can get a grasp on the collective dynamics, then I can actually go back and design the control system that pays attention to the whole operational, operational um, set of features. So what I'll present to you today are elements um, of, of such a theory that would hopefully not allow us only to design or operate such unique buildings, but also understand how we can across the board, large scale, understand and improve operation of these cookie cutter office buildings that you have a humongous number of and based on which our economy could be saving hundreds of billions of dollars a year if we are successful in this endeavor. So the target is very, 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 very good. The problem is very sophisticated scientifically. An interesting combination for somebody sitting in my chair, right? UCSB. <laughs> yeah, interesting is an interesting word. It means different things too. We've tackled problems like this, and, and the only reason I want to show you this is uh, besides the fact that it was published in Science, so a joke. Um, <laughs> is, is that um, here you have an event where the system was forced, the whole system of sort of response to a, a spill was forced by an external environmental disaster in that particular case. Um, but the problem was essentially two dimensional. You had these streaks of oil on the surface that um, we successfully predicted using some algorithms, at least the most robust parts. But then the idea was deploy the vehicles there so they could actually clean up these oil spills. So my point is you have a pollutant and the pollutant comes to the surface and spreads out. And now your task is twofold. One is detect where, it, where it's at. And the second one is deploy some cleaning vehicles to clean up the mess before it reaches the shore, which of course wasn't done, as we know. Um, the, the, the issue is, first of all, look at the, look at the dynamics of that thing. It's all curly and, and stretched and folded, and it's very complicated. Um, and there is a lot of uncertainty in how it's spreading. This is the, the, the NOAA prediction of where the oil spill could be. Um, so you should have an army of boats just cleaning up that stuff, and that's impossible. And, and it, it really doesn't look much like the original um, spread, the satellite-based pictures of the spread. But um, let's see. The, the, the problem is essentially the same as the one in buildings, and I'm going to argue that in a second, in the following sense. You have some green set, and that's the set you want to be, meaning, let's say, your oil slick shouldn't go further than a couple of miles from the source. That'd be ideal, right? No shore would be affected, and the cleanup crews would clean up everything very, very quickly if they only knew where the problem was. Fair point. Now, however, if it exits, and it's in the red, and it goes to the shore, then you're going to have a big problem. Or if it's somewhere under the surface, you're going to have a big problem as well. All right, you deploy some vehicles into the target area, and they go around, and they're being kicked around by, the, by these waves, and they stay in the box most of the time, and hopefully they are cleaning it, 
but you saw the red vehicle coming out every now and then. <clears throat> that kind of a design you might want to have in a building, and you do actually. Engineering practice is like that. If somebody is designing a new building, they're gonna say, well, here is your comfort levels, and here is how many days you're gonna be uncomfortable. I'm sorry, but that's, that's how it is. So you're outside of the box sometimes, but you'd like to be optimally within the box all the time. Now, this is a two-dimensional problem. The velocity field looks complicated. That's kicking these vehicles around. You're also guiding them to go through. The building has thousands of degrees of freedom, not two, thousands. And it's also being kicked around by atmosphere and ground temperatures and people coming in and so on and so forth. So what you need there is to reduce the complexity of problem to something much simpler. So systems engineering comes into the fore. There are companies out there that are already providing you with some visibility into what at least the data looks like. And at least on the supply side, here is Lucid Design dashboard, Agile Waves dashboard. Basically, they plug into the electric, uh, electrical system of the building, and they are sub-metering and telling you where the flow of energy is going to, which part of the building it goes to. And that's useful information, no doubt about it. Um, but it's limited in the sense that I'd also really like to know besides where the energy is going to, what the comfort of the occupants looks like, all the other different aspects of the building that is absolutely not contained in the electricity data. One thing I'd like to know in particular is I have a number of different knobs in this building that I can, that I, that I can actually change. Which knobs should I change to have the biggest impact on the outcome? Maybe I can reduce the problem from you know, 900 different parameters to 10. And I'll say something about that. So that's this little graphic that tells you on the left you have different parameters. This one here is the zone set point. Temperature here is probably 70 right now. Which might be a little low, by the way. Just saying. <laughs> um, so zone set point, and the thickness of the lines that are going towards the output, for example, this is the interior equipment, up there is facility electricity, is, is telling you how important is the set of parameters that is contained in one of these boxes to the output, for example, facility electricity. And this was done with a large number of parameters and outputs, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then the other sort of little vignette that I want to give you is this, you know, how does a building breed? Uh, if you take a look at this video, this is from Y2E2 building at Stanford. The S word. Anybody from Stanford? In the audience? I thought so. Uh, so this is their, this is their uh, Y2E2 building, and that's really well sensed. Uh, you have a large number of sensors that are temperature sensors that are presented here in black. This is the outside temperature, and you can see that during the night that penetrates in, and you see little blotches here and there. And this gives you a visual, but it certainly doesn't give you a diagnostic. My point here is the, our ability to visualize data, to take data and visualize it, uh, is becoming incredible on some buildings. So we should take that knowledge, try to understand it, provide the analytics, and then push it to as large a number of buildings as we possibly can. Um, hopefully some of the uh, technology uh, for, for doing that is going to come right out of here with tiny URL and other things that are, that are happening. So, all right, so uh, a little bit of mathematics, a couple of slides. Um, for those of you that are in control theory, uh, usually when we see an object that is dynamically evolving, like the one that I've shown you in that movie, there is certainly dynamics to that. You will write down a set of ordinary differential equations and you will then try to either solve those analytically, which is hard, except if they're linear, or you're going to go and solve them on a the computer and try to look at the outputs. That's our typical approach here and it, it served us extremely well um, in, in, in a large variety of contexts, large scale integrated systems. It so turns out that buildings are very complicated from that perspective. You are switching things on and on. You go to the light switch and you turn it on and that's actually a discontinuous change in the contributions to energy and the amount of photons in this room. So you can't write an ordinary differential equation. Um, this kind of a thing happened before 
um, for a different reason in the history of science, and that's when Heisenberg realized that he couldn't really write down an equation for position and velocity in quantum mechanics, and then he said, well, I can work with observables, so I can write a partial differential equation for the evolution of the observables. A little bit later on, people said, for Neumann in particular, so this comes from sort of a good pedigree historically, said, well, I can do this for an arbitrary dynamical system, and then that, and then Lorentz figured out that a small flap of a wing in Africa can change the weather in the United States. And then we all got entangled into drawing nice pictures of strange attractors for 30 years. And so, so this, which I'm going to argue is an, an interesting and useful approach, has been completely neglected for a long time until the 90s. It's not as recent as the last couple of years, but in the 90s we started looking back and saying, okay, I have an observable, I don't need to write down the differential equation, I have an observable and I have an evolution of that observable over time, so let me try to figure out how that evolves. And for those of you in fluid mechanics, uh, nothing is new under the sun, right? X dot is V of X leads to a partial differential equation that looks something like that, and then you solve that, and you can use spectral methods. In this particular case, you can split the spectrum in the point spectrum that tells you that there is some oscillatory part. Remember the oscillations in the building? And then some continuous part because dynamical systems have chaotic behavior and certainly occupants of the building when they walk in and out are going to provide for some of that chaotic behavior. My point here is just there is a split. And this part here that's in blue, you can actually get a handle on and represent as low dimensional modes and maybe you have only a few modes that you have to deal with instead of that whole uh, picture or that whole movie that I've shown you where every single point of the field looks very, very different. So we know quite a bit mathematically about that, um, about that uh, uh, setup. For example, I'll present you a, a plot like this with some dots that represent eigenvalues of the associated operator. And if I actually have these eigenvalues, for example, that are on top and on the left, I will know that I have a so-called so period four orbit. So I'll know actually exactly the frequency of oscillation of that system. Now, mind you, at this point, you might be reminded of Fourier analysis, which you've all learned. And this is its equivalent, but for the fully nonlinear systems. So when you do linear analysis, it actually provides you with exactly the linear modes and, and linear frequencies and so on. But you can apply this because you have extended your space to an infinite dimensional space to a fully nonlinear system. Okay, so what can we do with this? One of the things that we can do is take an arbitrary field, think of a temperature field. Here I've shown velocity because I'm gonna show you a, a movie and a plot pretty soon, and then split it into its parts that are oscillating, and perhaps I have an uncertainty part that has uh, what is called a continuous spectrum. <coughs> okay, we use that in a number of different problems. One of them was this. And of course, this could be a part of the building problem because it's just a jet coming out of, a, of an orifice. And looking at it, and what you're looking at is the velocity contour labeled in red. I think you'll agree with me that that's pretty complex as a spatial temporal evolution, right? There doesn't seem to be much periodicity. It's just coming out and evolving into all these horrible shapes. Shapes just like the oil did during the oil spill. Typical property of fluid flows at high Reynolds numbers. It so turns out when you actually work with that particular formalism that I just told you about, and this is all numerical simulation, so it's all computational fluid dynamics that we did together with Clancy Rowley at Princeton, Henningsson at, 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 uh, in Sweden, um, and uh, one of his students. Um, you get a plot that's similar to, to the one that I've shown you before, but that one was fake, and this one is real. So now I'm showing you true, real, true eigenvalues of that operator. Think matrix and plotting its eigenvalues that are in the unit circle. And this actually is going to, this complex conjugate pair has a frequency associated with it as does this one here. You can take that point, that's essentially a frequency aspect of the whole problem, and map it directly to the spatial aspect that corresponds to that frequency. And we call this a spatial mode. So the trick here is 
I haven't done only the, the frequency analysis. I haven't looked only at the, at the time evolution. I've actually been able to take the time evolution and tell you which mode in a fully nonlinear system corresponds to that particular frequency. And also it turns out that with these two modes, that one of whom looks like a, a lobster and the other one I can't tell, but, um, <clears throat> but it has periodicity on the, on the core and so on. They're relatively simple. I mean, they're spatially almost periodic if you take a look at that. So they have none of the complexity of the original thing. And that's the crux of the idea. So you start with something very complicated and you start to split it into these modes. For those of you that have heard about proper orthogonal decomposition, this is not it. This is a decomposition that actually pays attention to dynamically evolving oscillating components and every building oscillates all the time for a variety of reasons. Every building system oscillates all the time. Some reasons for that are good because it's tracking the outside temperature and some reasons for that are bad. It's just oscillating because there is an underlying instability. So um, what do we do with this? The Y2E2 building, for those of you who, do, who have never been to Stanford campus, is there. Uh, it was supposed to perform, this is months, this is energy use. It was supposed to perform there and it is here, which is exactly the code. So, when it was built, <coughs> things were added to it, and then it ended up performing not 50% better than the code. And so the question that you start asking is, what, is the, what are the various causes for that? So let's look at the analysis. So this is July, and you see the visuals of how the temperature in the building changes. And you're going to see these different blotches showing up and disappearing. And this is October, very similar. So the analysis, practically what we do is as follows. We take a look at what we call the Koopman spectrum, the straight lines up. These are indicating harmonics of the 24 hour cycle or harmonics of an eight hour cycle if people are coming in and out at eight hours. Easy to interpret. Some of these lines that are horizontal and there is no, there is no energy to them, they actually correspond to spaces that are, that are maintained extremely well Data center, 65 degrees, you should see a flat line, no oscillations over 24 hours. So there are the verticals and there are the horizontals and you can read them off. And then if you see something like this, that might be bad because it's neither a vertical or a horizontal. You map it to its Koopman mode. You have a data center next to the office space. It starts an oscillation, you know, 20 to 30 minute time scale. The algorithm detects it automatically and says, go look there. That's the idea. It's not data mining. So I use this as a comic relief sometimes and I hope there are no data mining people in the audience, but nobody needs to tell me that the sine curve is a sine curve by data mining. A sine curve corresponds to some kind of a frequency analysis. And so we'd better learn from the 300 years of development of calculus as far as analyzing these kinds of data. Every problem has a different every physical problem in principle might have a different solution. The novelty here is that you can utilize it in a fully nonlinear switching hybrid system context. It is not the old Fourier analysis that, that you knew and, and loved, but it's, it's related to the properties of this particular operator that I have, that I have described. Okay, um, you can do really a variety of different things with this energy plus model of the building on the left, sensor data on the right. If you're just looking at the plots, it might be hard to uh, compare and validate. But if you extract these major modes, then you can compare the modes. Instead of <clears throat> energy plus is a beautiful tool. We can use it to predict energy efficiency in a building. And it has all these details with all the sensing, virtual sensing that you want. But if you look at the most of research papers using Energy Plus, they, there's several points of comparison, most of them being bulk energy used in a year in a building computed versus sensed. The thing on the left has tremendous potential, right? It has all these points of data that you can probe it with. And so what I'm trying to do 
is use those modes, slow global modes of breathing in the building, to compare how the building performs on a daily, on a monthly basis with the performance of the model. Here are some details. And it's interesting. Koopman spectrum for the energy plus, Koopman spectrum for sensor data. There is way more energy in the, in the various modes for the energy plus. It has much more intensified dynamics in this particular model that was provided to us by Martin Fisher and his student Tobias Stanford, then the, 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 associated, the associated sensor. Now you can go in and tweak the parameters of the model or put an optimization routine around it to actually change that and compare in a much more sensible way. I guess my point is the numerical tools that we have way outrun our ways of comparing them so far. And the kinds of tools that we should be using should be much more detailed analysis of the underlying <coughs> dynamics from my perspective. So we took these tools and <coughs> applied it to the problem that we care um, deeply about and that's the student resources building, uh, 60,000 square, uh, square feet, utilized by students. Uh, it's a recent construction, so it's three years old now, lead silver. Um, large thermal mass, natural ventilation, a very nice atrium right in the middle there um, that provides a lot of the fresh air for the building. <coughs> um, but we already knew from just interviewing the occupants that some portions were extremely uncomfortable. So we wanted to understand aspects of why this building that, that is actually designed in a very interesting way as a mix of natural convection and air conditioning would have uh, areas that are uncomfortable. <coughs> uh, it's not a bad building on the CBEX database, the energy use versus the type of building. It uses, I think, about two thirds of uh, electricity, for example, of, of similar office buildings. So, so the situation is not bad to start with. Um, we build the model. <coughs> this on the left is the output of one of the things, for example, the mean temperature from 20th of March to 29th of April. But one of the problems for us in getting to this kind of a, a graph was to get all the data necessary. Because as I mentioned, this was a naturally convected building. Most of it is naturally convected. This atrium here is naturally convected. The outside offices are supposed to be naturally convected. There is air conditioning in this one in here. You see nice light blue here and you see red there. These people are cooking and these people are fine. This is air conditioned, this is not. And the, the, the flow was supposed to go from here and basically kind of alleviate the effects of the external temperatures by the combination of opening the windows and, and, um, and force there. So anyhow, there is, a, there is a problem, but we couldn't identify the problem to start with because if you have only a portion of the building air conditioned, then you don't have thermostats in most of the space naturally convected parts of the space, who cares? You don't put a thermostat because there is no system coupled to it, right? My perspective, wrong. <laughs> because this is a lead silver building, so I'd like to know how it operates. I can't know how it operates if I don't know the full energy picture pretty much at every space. Uh, what we did is we um, took these sensors from Innovonics. <coughs> they're not an eyesore either, they're actually nice. The black areas were previously unsensed and uh, we sense them now. The atrium had some sensing, but it was very, just one thermostat. So we added sensors there too. It's green here, but it's actually, it's actually not. It should be kind of some kind of a neutral color because the sensing, the sensing was not enough. <coughs> so, <coughs> okay, then we go into the analysis. <coughs> I'm going to show you only, only a few and then I'm gonna show you a list of what all happened. Remember, this is a 2008 building, um, high-end design, <coughs> nice new building management system, um, Johnson Metasys, that we could put all the data from into an SQL database. We also added the wireless sensor data and fused it with that, so we actually had a full database of full sensing of the building. And here is, for example, one thing that you find out with those modes that I just mentioned, the Koopman operator modes that I mentioned a couple of times. You find out that that auditorium that is on top, that is here and there, um, so first and second floor, 
is oscillating on a two hour on a two hour time scale, and that's very easy to get right away. There were uh, there was anecdotal evidence from people who were operating the building that there is something wrong going on. But if you think about it, the time scale is such that it's a two hour time scale. I mean, nobody's really in the auditorium for two hours. They're there for 45 minutes. So nobody's gonna notice, nobody's gonna call and say, or maybe they're gonna call and say I'm too hot. But the, the underlying root cause was an oscillation. So uh, you take a look at what's the cause for the oscillation. The thermostat for this is in the hallway. There is another thermostat in the kitchenette right next to that auditorium. The thermostat in the kitchenette is right next to the toasters. <laughs> it's supposed to be comic relief. I mean, it's not funny if you're, you're worried about energy, but the thermostat is right next to a toaster. I repeat. <laughs> so the other one is in the hallway. It should be in the auditorium itself. So somebody in the implementation phase just didn't do it, right? They just put it wherever they thought Surely the engineers that designed this did not order that particular remedy, right? Um, it, it was put in at the place where it was put in, and now it's causing this particular oscillation because the two thermostats are basically combining the reads, the air flows are going back and forth, and the toaster is up, there is a lot of cold air that comes in because obviously the temperature gets higher, and so on and so forth. So that's one of, one of the things that you can very easily discover without actually necessarily being in the building, and, and I would argue that being in the building, you'd need to be there for two hours to figure out that things are changing periodically. You might figure out something's wrong. I'm hot, I'm cold. But the issue here was that there was a periodic, periodic change where these things were actually fighting each other. Right? The other thing that was quite interesting is, has to do, I mean, interesting from, look, from a scientific point of view besides being interesting from an operational point of view. There are a number of other things that are operational that I'm gonna point out in a second, but this is really interesting scientifically. We found out that there are rooms that are actually air conditioned that during the night heat up. So you turn off the air conditioner and the temperature in the room heats up. So you're like impossible. There must be some loads or something in there, not going in, not willing to go in because we are doing everything remotely, right? Stand back, look at the data, figure out what's going on. Impossible. Run the model. Energy Plus shows exactly the same thing. Any guesses as to what's going on? It's actually relatively simple. Radiative heat transfer, right? The, the building has a pretty large thermal mass. It heats up. You turn off the air conditioner. What was suppressed before just comes up. And during the night, these things heat up. The next day is hot, you should probably start air conditioning at five o'clock in the morning or something to actually shave off that peak. Nobody does. My point is, the detection of an issue like this, again, through the tools that I've shown you, leads to an interesting question in optimization. What is an optimal way of running these rooms? And this is, uh, on this slide, it's, it's one, but there are actually a number of different rooms. So it's not an isolated small problem. It's actually a, a pervasive problem in the building. These are the most dominant examples. Normal operation during the day, nice and light cold, and then you're going to the green. This guy goes into, into uh, orange because it was yellow during the day. So it, it actually affects a large portion of the building and you should change the operational schedule to actually adapt to that. I guess my point here being also, look, the tool is adapt to the physics of the building somehow. It kind of, as you would expect, because in some sense frequency anal analysis or spectral analysis is inherent to some aspects of physics that we build our intuition on. So it's actually adapt to sort of weeding out whatever aspects of thermal dynamics, dynamics you have. <clears throat> okay, we found a lot of different things. Again, this is a new building, and uh, a, a number of them have been adjusted by, by the facilities. Um, a lot of them had to do something with scheduling. Um, a number of them had to do with, uh, the, the, with thermostats, unresponsive heating, inadequate cooling, and so on and so forth. I'm showing this slide to, to um, mention that we do work with our facilities and we actually have a two-way relationship. In other words, what we do, we actually point out to them and, and, and uh, if they have time, because you have to realize six people maintaining 80 buildings on campus, that's not exactly a good ratio. Um, uh, but they, they mostly go after these and, and try to reduce them. 
One thing that, that strikes you kind of almost immediately is the red portion on top. This is the energy consumption uh, for hot water. Um, one of these um, problems that indicated um, excessive boiler operation, you'd say, well, excessive boiler operation is working on during the night, so you, know, you shouldn't be operating that during the night, but it's not so easy. It was actually detected by unusual patterns in the reheat for the VAV units. You know, it, was, it wasn't necessarily that, so if you looked at the occup occupancy and things like that, you wouldn't necessarily guess it first and say, well, your boiler is on for too long. But you look at the reheat patterns and things like that, you're saying, well, that's interesting. I'm reheating when the occupancy is not correct. So it was a combined effect of occupancy and the reheat in the VAV issues. We, de we detected this uh, um, boiler issue. And, and if you take a look at the amount of reduction in, in hot water usage, it's actually very substantial on just that one item. So I spoke about now optimizing, um, and <clears throat> I want to combine these things into a, a certain type of a vision. I, I wouldn't go and try to necessarily optimize everything around. I mean, you have 1,000 different parameters here. We are studying a, a medium office building and you have three floors, approximately 5,000 meters square, so 50, 54,000 square feet. Um, you have 746 different parameters in the nominal energy plus model. This is not data. So by the way, I do want to mention what I've done with these operators and the mathematics that we've done worked equally well for the computational fluid dynamics and directly from the data. So you can do that comparison directly. You don't need to write down ordinary differential equations to do anything of that sort. My point is the model part is not ne necessary for the analysis that I've given you. Um, but here, we are going from models strictly and saying, what would happen if we varied the parameters like zone set points or heat conductivities, change the insulation and things like that? You'd say, when I vary all of these, what is the probability distribution of my performance? What is the variance in the performance that I get over all these different parameters? Um, so what you're seeing on the right is such probability distributions for the full system, the annual consumption, and the peak demand over an hour, so top hour in a year. And there is one thing, th there are two things here. One is, if anybody is interested in, in looking at how we've done this, uh, it actually does beat the competition by about an order of two of magnitude as far as the, l the, the size of, this, of the building and the number of parameters that we have, that we have been able to do this with. But I want to concentrate on the building issues. And one issue that strikes you is, take a look at the black distribution, the amount of electricity in the nominal model, either yearly or peak, and then take a look at the green, which is the building updated with the ground source heat pump and insulation and things like that. Okay, it performs 40% better in the mean. But the other thing that is really, really interesting here is that the uncertainty about how it's going to perform has shrunk very substantially. So what you achieve by adding components that change the energy efficiency in your building, and this should be, I think, added in the cost equation, is not only that you get much better performance, but you also shrink the variability. Why? I mean, some of the reasons are obvious. If you add better insulation, you're insulated better from the outside, outside effects. And so therefore, your, your uh, variability is going to shrink. But that only explains about 35% of that shrinkage. So it's not just that. It's a lot of other things that conspire to reject the various uncertainties that exist in the system and make the distribution much tighter. And the second point towards the end that I'd like to make is, is the following one. You can optimize energy and comfort at the same time. <coughs> Very often if you walk into a building, the operator is going to say, yeah, I know what you're gonna tell me, just turn off everything. That's an easy way to save energy. I mean, there's, there's no dispute with that. You can turn off all the systems and, and you're going to be using exactly zero energy. But, so very often it's thought that there is this 
competition between comfort and energy savings. And if you recall, one of my first slides with the oil spill was kind of a box, a green box. I wanted to keep the system there while optimizing its performance. So here, I'd like to keep the system within a certain temperature range or, or, or whatever measure of comfort uh, uh, pre predicted mean vote in this particular case, which is some measure of the production of heat inside your body and the external elements like the temperature versus energy, right? So this is how comfortable you are and this is how much energy you're wasting. So the plot on the top tells you take a look at all the PMV values of zero, which means you're comfortable. Plus two, you're too hot. Minus two, you're, you're cold. Zero, you're comfortable. And try to take a look at the distribution of energy use. Shockingly, well, it, it was actually a little bit of shock to us. The nominal is red. A large part of that energy distribution is to the left. You actually get better energy efficiency by improving comfort. The same thing with the plot on the bottom. Here is the minimum energy set of parameters. And you take a look at the distribution of those, and you have a nice spread in PMV. Yeah, you can, you can do worse, but if you choose very well, you can do way better. Your comfort is going to be exactly at zero right there. All right. So with those, I'll, uh, I'll close. Uh, tell you that we are interested not only in aspects of uh, building. We have some really good graphics artists at UCSB. Peter Allen did this for us. Uh, we are really inter we are interested in other things like um, um, how the saved power can be piped back to the grid. We have worked on quite a bit of, uh, quite a number of instability problems in the grid due to alternative sources and things like that. It will take another talk. I certainly won't go much through that. Um, I will leave you with uh, this slide as to what our mission uh, is and, and hopefully it coincides, or I think it does coincide with large elements of, uh, of your vision here and I spoke with Carl Brown quite a bit about this. But, um, one of the things that we do is pursue research and development enabling accelerated adoption of integrated systems. And that's what I spoke about. But there are other things that are extremely important and, and equally valuable as high-end research and that's providing metrics and establishing best practices for optimization of energy efficiency. And then the last, but by far not the least, maybe I should have put it first, educating the next generation of researchers and professionals in these integrated building systems technologies because there is a schism between the IT side of the equation and the thermal or energy side of the equation. And I don't think we are doing a very good job institutionally of getting professionals that understand both sides at the same time. There are of course always people that are going to understand those and they're extremely valuable and they're in the field and you'll go for them when you see them but it's not institutional yet. So one of the things that we are proposing at UCSB is running a sequence of classes that are actually going to enable such an interaction and en enable such knowledge um, unification from the two fields, which now maybe at even more than in any other time in history is becoming incredibly important. So that's what I'm cl close with and uh, we work with a variety of different institutions. Um, it, uh, we have some current ongoing project with um, LBNL, with Hans Johansson, who might or might not be here. There he is. And we are hoping to have more of these interactions because it's uh, part of the common goal, and, and, and especially in this current economic climate and, and, and the goals that the country has as a whole, I think it's an incre incredibly important endeavor. So with that, um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we can we have a few minutes for a few questions. Question. Okay. Hold on just a minute. We're, uh, Anisha is coming back, with, uh, coming around with the microphone for you.
Yeah. Um, as the um, delivery of temperature to users of buildings becomes more personalized and, and you get variation from desk to desk uh, in temperatures responding to controls offered to the users, is there any problem with collecting desk-by-desk uh, -desk data on user satisfaction and on physical parameters? So uh, two answers. One is I, I think that's actually a quite an exciting development. The complexity of it uh, you can easily understand by just realizing that it's already going on in your car. <laughs> the passenger has their, their own controls and the driver has their own controls and you all know that nobody's happy. So uh, it, it, it becomes a complex issue that has to deal with the mixing of fluid flow between the different, be, between the different units. So in that particular case, you'd need more sensing. Um, or an effective model that would actually tell you how well things are done and a combination of sensing that now can be reduced and the model, which is the kind of thing I favor. So essentially, you, you do state estimation by saying, I'm going to sense at a couple of places and I'm going to know the whole picture by running a model in the background that's actually going to, to fill the gap based on, again, physics, not pure interpolation. Um, the saving grace for many office buildings might be that uh, people have computers at their desks. And many, I mean, pretty much all computers are equipped with a temperature sensor. So how we could tap into some of these, this ubiquity in sensing that is not necessarily related to energy efficiency in buildings is, is an interesting question. Um, you, need, you would still need to do estimation because you need to differentiate between the external temperature and the temperature that's being produced by the, by the heat on the chip, but I, but I actually think that's possible. And so that gives, uh, yeah, so we're hoping to look into a really interesting building in New York where something like that is, has been, um, has been uh, implemented, and so maybe I'll have a little bit more to say next year. <clears throat> Any other questions? I think we have time for one more. Um, so how is the, uh, the comfort level the exactly tied into your equation of uh, optimizing for energy consumption? So um, optimization usually has a cost function associated with it. So usually optimization is done on energy efficiency. So how efficient you are with some constraint that you shouldn't go below or above certain temperatures. It's expressed as a constraint. Of in, in our case, we actually do what is called a predicted mean value, which is an equation, an empirical equation that couples the temperatures and metabolic rates to the, to the perceived comfort. So what happened is researchers um, did an experiment where a number of different people were working under different conditions and reporting on their level of comfort. So that PMV was actually part of the cost function. So when you're optimizing, you're optimizing so that you get maximum comfort at at, at minimum energy, right? It's sort of a min-max optimization problem. One last question. You were saying that your, your, your model, or I guess the Energy Plus model has like 700 different parameters, or states, I guess. Or a that, thousand, yeah. Or a thousand, or what have yeah. you. So how, I mean, how, how have you managed to simplify, and like, how many states are you talking? Okay, um, so we start with a whole, with a whole system and we sample it at various different, different points. Once we do that, we actually define a meta model that describes the state of the system with a much smaller number of parameters. Once we do that, we actually perform a sensitivity analysis that in this particular case extracted in the nominal model 57 parameters and in the, in the energy efficient model 63 parameters that were important. So out of a thousand to start with, you actually narrow the field down to let's say 50, you know, 50 different ones. If you take a look, so there, there are two aspects of this that are interesting to point out. One is, usually people tell you operationally, and I've, I've met a lot of people like this, would say, well, I don't care, you know, three parameters and I'll know everything about that building. That, to a large degree, is just not true. 10, 20, 50, three, definitely not. <laughs> so you can do an extreme reduction. And, and if you look at some of the 
excellent intuition as to how people build buildings in past centuries. It was excellent human data mining or physical neural network that was doing that. And these people were capable of handling a large number of parameters. Um, that's one aspect of it. But if you have a thousand different parameters, you need to run your system about 5,000 times. On a standard CPU, it takes 15 minutes per run. So maybe the graphical processing unit, you can do this you know, in, with an ordinary computer. Otherwise, you need a Linux cluster right now. And, and that was for entire building or? Entire building. Entire yeah. building. Entire building. How many yeah. like, rooms are we talking about? So, 60,000 uh, square feet. Um, the rooms depend on you know what your setup is, but let's say 40 offices, 50 offices per floor, three floors. Yeah. Uh, but you're talking about zones, though. Sure. That's the question that you're asking. 15 zones. 15 Yeah, I mean, this is the question of return on investment, essentially. So uh, if, if you take a look at current building management systems and how expensive they are, they are expensive. The, the good side of this is I think they are undersold, perhaps because there, are, there is a lack of analytic tools, but they are undersold in the sense that it's not only that you know, they allow you the monitoring, but when things go wrong, you can actually very easily get access to that information in the building. And that lasts forever, I mean, until the building is there. And then the changes that are necessary are just changing a set point or something like that. So you're, you're continually saving. Um, the other side of the equation is, yes, of course, most buildings just don't have building management systems. With the wireless technologies, with developments like TinyURL and things like that, we might hope that you're going to have an effective building management system um, that is going to be able to get you the best out of the equipment that you already have if you really want to go with zero cost. At the end of the day, every building owner has a capital investment fund, which is essentially, well, do I put $5,000 here or $10,000 here to change this? So let's suppose that the building management system cost comes down with all these wireless developments and everything else. Then we are going to have a very large stash of buildings to, to look into and, and improve at, I think, a reasonable cost. But it's, we are st when you're looking at tools like this, yeah, they're still reduced, I mean, from sensing, they're still reduced to really well-sensed buildings. When you're looking at the model development, that I would argue can give you a baseline as long as you have validated, very well-validated models. And that's part of my talk. I argued that the validation that we're doing with Energy Plus and DOE and everything else that's on the market, Francis, everything else that's on the market right now is just very poor compared with what we should be doing and, and what the system actually enables you to do. Okay, thank you very much.